I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN and your host for the Cloud 2030 podcast. Today's episode is unusual in that you really should look at the video. Uh, we talk about Backstage.io and we have that conversation centered around a demo uh, done by one of the RackN interns, uh, Xander Franks. Uh, he's been exploring with a Backstage to digital rebar integration and the conversation that results from that really explains Backstage in some fundamental ways and what it takes to build good developer portals. You will find in this episode both the broader information about how to do integrations where you have a developer portal as a front end and the key insights about how Backstage works. Take time, enjoy this whole podcast, uh, both in video and audio format. Martez and Klaus, are you familiar with Backstage? Because I can give a, a thumbnail of what it is and why, why we're playing with it. I am. I am not, so I, would, uh, I wouldn't mind the uh, elevator spiel on it. Cool. Uh, Backstage is a CNCF incubated project um, that is, it's not a Kubernetes project per se, it's adjacent. Um, it was written by Spotify as part of their internal dev self-service system. And so they wrote a platform that is um, basically designed for them to, to you know, have developers uh, build and maintain self-service projects. Um, it's written in, uh, I think, Node TypeScript uh, as a platform and it's radically extensible. So it's really a mi pretty minimal framework on its own um with um sort of some you know uh, the ability to do an extension around it um that it's, that almost sounds like platform engineering as a service it's it's platform engineering from the developer self service side which is partly why we're we're interested in what we're looking at it doesn't do anything um, uh, Xander, Xander, I think one of the things that we had to work out and Xander will walk through is some of the scaffolding stuff where you actually give it a really simple set of steps, but it's, it's not really an infrastructure thing. It's more of a catalog. Um, okay. uh, so pretty minimal. This is the thing with a lot of platform engineering work is it's, um, if you're talking about dev, the dev side of it, it's designed to be, you know, pretty lightweight. But you know, on purpose, the devs just need, hey, I need a cluster, go build it. You know, should follow spec. I don't want to spend a lot of time or have a lot of knobs. Um, whereas from the ops side, it's a totally different. You know, the experience has to be different. Um, and so what what we're looking at is can, can backstage provide some dev UX uh, that we can plumb in on the back end. And, and from that perspective, it's, it's generally like the stuff we're doing, I think, is generally useful because assuming Backstage continues to generate the interest it is, then being able to, you know, plumb things into Backstage as a, as a quick sort of portal with a catalog um, for self-service would, you know, I, I think a lot of companies are very interested in that. Oh, yes. I yes. see the usefulness in that. Sorry, Martez. No, so uh, I, I I see it uh, in a similar fashion, but the the way I see it in many ways, for for good or for bad, starts to go back to the the single pane of glass idea, in which I need a portal to aggregate information, whether it be information about my services, information about my CI builds. It, it's in many ways it's becoming that place where, hey, I need to to log in in the morning and find a place in which I can sort of get that, that overall view of all the systems, all the information I might need, as well as when you start talking about onboarding new developers or even in theory, new operations folks or really any folks from a technical standpoint to the organization, it's starting to become some of that, that wiki, that, that confluence people try mm -hmm. to make work, but never really got traction. And so to, to Rob's point in terms of extensibility, that's where a, a lot of the major value is starting to be realized of being able to bring in information from external systems and then aggregate that in a single place. A good, that's a good ad.
Cool. Xander, after your little bit of, of, you've done more than a little study at this point, do um, you have anything to add that we're, we're missing? Um, I can't say, I, I think I've been kind of looking at backstage from the perspective of developing a plugin. So I think I've missed a lot of the like kind of important practicality of it, but <laughs> I don't think I can no add worries. too much in that regard. Uh, well, that's, I think, I think the, the, the key question comes back to, is it, you know, how, how hard is it to actually do the extensions? Um, um so, I, I think yeah. for the most part, it was pretty easy. I ran into some issues. I think, so I wasn't familiar with yarn instead of NPM, they're using yarn. So it took me some time mm -hmm. getting that to work. Um, it's a little touchy in some spots. Um, some of the documentation isn't super clear, but I was able to figure it out after, you know, just trial and error for a while. But for the most part, it's like, aside from rough documentation in some spots, it's, it's really powerful. Like you can see all of the immense, um, I don't know, just things you can do with it aggregate stuff in one spot it's a cool way to have like a an extendable portal you want to you want to walk us through what you did yeah yeah um, sure i just got everything cool. set up so awesome let's see here we go so i've got the backstage instance here do you see my screen right now i do perfect okay so i've got backstage here um first i'll walk you through what i've done so far and i'll sh then i'll take you through how it works how i set it up um, so your request was to be able to create and spin up a cluster from Backstage. So I go over here to create. We get the templates. I added this create DRP cluster template. I can click choose, put in the endpoint. So I can come over here and steal this endpoint. Awesome. And then I'll call it Backstage cluster and we can give it a whatever broker. It doesn't matter. Just in this case, it needs to be able to get sent over to DRP. Uh, okay, you haven't you haven't built the, the full cluster, everything necessary to start, have right. a cluster start. Okay. And these fields are are totally, you can change them from within the template schema. So uh, just right, right now, I just needed the baseline of information to be able to spin up a cluster. Gotcha. So if I hit next step, it'll uh, let me review what I've picked and click create. Uh, it'll show me what's happening. And I also added a little link here that should say jump to cluster in the UX. That'll take us to portal.rec and the IO, but I've got it open here in tests. So you'll see it's it's here now. I just created this one. Seventy nine. But yeah, I'm, so I'm just I'm looking at here's here's mine. Oh, it says backstage cluster. I see. I have my own version of that that UX. So. Oh, I see. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh it spins up the cluster now, which is pretty nice. And this would I could I think it could add more output here if you wanted to see more information. But right now this is just it's just sending sending a uh you know a route call. It's just saying hey right. post to this route, and it creates it. So the way this works in the back end. Um, people with their own backstage instances can create templates, which is kind of what that create DRP endpoint page was. Um, it's just okay. specified in the YAML. And then, so you have the metadata for the template here, your parameters is how the, how backstage builds that form for you. So I have this endpoint field, the name field, the broker field. Of course you could extend this with more options. Uh, and then steps is what actually oh, happens nice. when you run okay. the template. So the action is this DRP clusters create and the input, we're just giving it our parameters from the endpoint name and broker. And then that will call our DRP actions plugin, this specific action. And in this right. output, you can just have it linked to something. So that's the templates part. So, uh, the so if, if I had a step that generated some information, could I, could I pass that forward to the, another step? Yeah, I, I believe so. So this templating okay. thing, I so think I it allows you to, yeah, you can pass information around. And I think okay. parameters just steals from this right here. But yeah, I think it, I'm pretty sure you can totally seamlessly pass stuff around that way. Yeah, it's probably, I think, probably I, an I output for it, steps. Sorry? This is probably an output in yeah. steps similar mm -hmm. to the input. It, this syntax reminds me a lot of uh, Concourse CI uh, where, hmm. you, where you assemble your your jobs in, in a very similar manner. Yeah, that's, that's cool. So yeah, so we could, uh, oh wait, hold on, parameters, endpoint, clusters, name. Yeah, you're you're assuming everything. It'd be nice, Xander, it'd be cool to have an output where you like picked up the UUID of the cluster or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, totally. And that should be possible too, I think. So it actually brings me to my next point. So this plugin here, I've got this DRP actions back in plugin. Um, here's the actual action that handles creating the cluster. 
So it kind of redefines the schema of what inputs it expects. And then here's where the real meat happens. It's this handler. Um, this uses the TypeScript API that we just wrote. Um, so we spin it up, we pass in our endpoint, which comes from this endpoint field that I just showed you in that template. Um, the token gets set from the config of backstage. And then all we have to do is just api.clusters.create. And this is all auto filled with <laughs> wow. cluster okay. stuff. So yeah, it's 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 pretty so, so there's so so there's one of the things you did was you built a digital rebar type strip, which clusters is a core type for us, create is a core verb. Mm -hmm. You're just passing information into that create. Okay. Interesting. If I got rid of this, I think it might error because it's expecting some. Yeah, it's expecting some mm -hmm. types that um it's supposed to be familiar with. I'm not passing everything that's required to specify a cluster because um if I did something like as hold on, you could say cons cluster equals steal all this and then we do this now i think we get autocomplete for uuid and stuff so yeah so now okay you can <laughs> really easily see what what fields need to go into making an object wow all right so and then yeah, when I when I was reading this, I thought part of what the handler allowed you to do is that you can return outputs. So I, th I think outputs are part of the spec. You're just you're just not. Yeah, I think they have this output go. method here, and you can pass some value to it, which is pretty cool. I think you can use that from the. If I go back to the template YAML, um, I think there would be a a template field like output dot foo if I wanted to go in here and and say output bar kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think then in that case, if this returns a, it looks like it returns a machine. So if we could probably just come in here and do something like, um, oh, it probably wants us to do. Maybe. Sorry, I'm not totally familiar with what. That's all right. That's cool. Yeah. That needs to be awaited. There you go. Nice. Sweet. So now All that right. should output that, and then we could even come <laughs> back and get rid of this name thing here and just do that. All right, that's cool. That's powerful. So, so if this this is where it comes back to, if you have the API documented, building up. A couple of methods like this to make a ton of sense. Is there a delete? Did you you did you have when you define the, the the cluster here? I'm interested in what the scaffold looks like on that side. Okay, I think you'd have to add another action here. I have it returning an array, so you could create. You could just copy this whole thing right here. Um, let's do this. I could call it delete. Okay, I just needs an endpoint and a UID, and then. Only difference is going to be that now instead of creating the await api.clusters.delete, I think it just, yeah, you can just pass in the UUID directly. So it's ctx.input.uuid. <laughs> yeah. Should be super easy to extend them. The code completes really make this very nice. Yeah. And I was looking into, since this is so easy to, to write manually, I was looking into having some kind of um, YAML file to easily map from backstage action ID to DRP endpoint, like route. Because that way you wouldn't have to write any of this code out. You could just write a YAML entry that would build this code for you pretty much. So that way we could instantly create... Right, so you would have DRP clusters uh, create and DRP clusters destroy. You wouldn't pass. You wouldn't have to pass data between them. Um, so as far as generating the actions goes, right? So like if we wanted to instantly generate uh, ba backstage actions for every possible route of alerts or clusters or machines. I see. Okay. Interesting. Either way, it's super easy to add more actions. I think that just kind of gives us more. It, it allows us to batch create like 10 new actions at a time okay yeah that that would that would make sense although i yeah 
having having everything available might be overkill from that perspective. Oh yeah, totally. Sometimes having too many too many options can be confusing. Um, and then was I, one of the things I was playing with is that there was a way to. Can you jump back to the UX for backstage? Yeah, sure. This is really cool. You done great work. Um, is there there I. I was playing with a way to actually retrieve like all the clusters that you already have. I think, I think your work should be here. Yeah. Right here. Okay. Oh, and okay. that code will be over here. I do this. That code is over in the separate plugin right here. This is the one that you'd written called digital rebar. Um, I believe this is what you wanted right in here. Maybe. Oh yeah. I just, I just, I just dumped in a JSON object. <laughs> Um, but with the TypeScript stuff, you're li that's literally what a um, DRPA API, a DRAPI clusters uh, list. Yeah, I think I'd have to add the package reference for this plugin. But yeah, you could totally okay. just map the type and it would give you all the autocomplete easily. Interesting. Oh, and then you had to figure out how to put the token for the cluster into the config file. Okay. Oh, yeah, so this is would be reference. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, now that we have, I have in my the package .chase and I have the token in there. So if there's a way to grab stuff from the config from within this component, then we don't even need to pass the token in anywhere. There should be. I would expect it. Okay. Huh. Let's see. I'd have to check their documentation. I'm sure it's there. Well, that would be that would be cool to see because then after you've created it, the the next steps would be to show that cluster on that list so that you could see what the clusters are, and then um, just implement delete. Because right now there's no. How would you delete? <laughs> you've created um, the one. <laughs> I think I don't know if it makes quite as much sense to delete from like a like a, a template like this because this kind of implies that you're creating something from a template. Uh, but you could totally implement the. The oh, delete the delete action from the plugin that you wrote. Okay. Like we could have a like a trash can icon right here or something that would kind of follow a similar workflow as the RUX. I wonder if that's what somebody would expect. So you'd be, oh well, you would because you're creating a new template. I've built the template. Well, so the one that you oh, this is this is creating a cluster, right? And then where it goes, you know, right, right? That's a different. You have to go back to the the list. So it's gonna right. get, gonna depend on how you you treat it. Um, so okay. take some example, something like ServiceNow, where everything is done to the catalog. There would often be multiple actions in which I have a create action as a catalog item, and then I might have a delete or update action as two additional separate items. So it's really gonna okay. depend upon where you want the experience to go through. What so what is, what would that mean? I, I know we don't have a complete system here. Would yeah, so, be, go ahead. so it, it would be like so where you have the the create cluster, you would have a, another one similar to it. If you treated it like a service pure self service catalog, you might have one that says delete drp cluster and then okay. you're going to have to then reference or look up existing clusters one of the biggest challenges was that that then becomes how you want to associate the references from a user standpoint so what i mean by that is user comes in creates a cluster who should have access to be able to delete that cluster when i now go back in right right the permissions become a, a thing or you yeah. need to filter it somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd like to be filtered by permissions based on the user or access they have. Um, yeah, so full disclosure, this is literally the uh, type of problems I deal with on a daily basis. <laughs> no, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're here. Then that's. Uh, are you doing them in backstage? No. So, uh, so the company I work for, Morpheus Data, uh, is right. a self service platform primarily for uh, infrastructure, and so we have our own service catalog. Uh, that has things similar to this, as well as we have integration with ServiceNow. And so uh, oftentimes I'm dealing with two types of catalogs and how to, to best expose that to end consumers. Gotcha. Classic, classic catalog challenges. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that makes sense. Interesting. 
I think the only reason I'd be hesitant to have like a delete action here is because the header of this page implies you'd be creating something. Yeah, and so that's where it gets tricky. And then especially if you had the the list of of clusters, then you'd have to do the filtering there uh, of trying to figure mm -hmm. out based upon a, a given user's level of access or role association or group association, which clusters they should be able to delete or destroy. If if we built one, say, that had a timer on it that automatically auto cleaned up, like if we put a parameter in there, can you go back to the code that does the task? Like we could create a trigger and a timer to do a removal. You mean the template like or the action the, in here? The action, I guess. Yeah, I, I, you can pass parameters. Whatever there, parameters so. you want. So you could just put a parameter that that has the the delete after X days. Type of mm -hmm. thing. And then, and then we'd have a separate cleanup task behind the scenes. I'm just, I'm trying to think, cause otherwise, yeah, you're going to have, this is what I haven't seen with backstage yet is I've got a catalog. I create something somewhere. You're going to want to say, show people what they've created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can the state, we can state management it. challenge, which is similar to what service now deals with of I've got an object or I've got a construct. And while I can yeah. click on certain things in terms of, of objects in service now, but to be able to actually manage them with a level of full fidelity is very tricky. Gotcha. Without going to service now, you mean? So even in service now. So <laughs> really? Often, so, yeah, I, don't so, know that, I don't know that much about service. Yeah. Now. So from service now standpoint, oftentimes the, I think a lot of the initial idea was that a, consumer would be requesting a thing, whether it was a mouse, a chair, a keyboard, whatever it might be. And typically that's a one-time transaction. There's no additional uh, operations that need to be performed. And so if you think of it as that model, then when you're trying to introduce something that essentially is quote unquote stateful, it becomes very challenging from a UX perspective of, okay, I'm able to create something easily. I have information about what it is, but now how do I then interact with that given thing after the fact? Right, that's a service now problem. Backstage is gonna. I, I, my assumption has been that it was it was creating there. You know, people were getting resources or a Kubernetes cluster or something out of this. It wasn't just kick off my build process. Like it was create a Git repo for me. Um, like that's one of the examples they keep using is set up a project. Oh, I guess that's that's a not really stateful. If I'm if my to do here is set up a project a yeah. Ruby project in Git. Then, it's one-time operation. Yeah. Then I've got the thing and I'm good to go. Gotcha. That's why it's that's why it's structured around the template initially on what you're gonna do. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging problem. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely is. I, and it's it's interesting because I had not thought through that use case as much like the one and done use case hmm. like you know give me a get you know a github op, a github cluster you know set the cluster up hand it over to me i'm done i'll i'll you know i, I usually assume people are going to clean that you know want automatic cleanup or have a life cycle for something like that but you're, you're changing my my thinking a little bit which is good yeah, and that's where it gets very interesting when you start talking about um, even the idea of things like IDPs or internal developer platforms, as well as even the, the overall construct of single pane of glass. And then even what we've seen from sort of a uh, an evolution of the idea of service now, or not service now, but uh, self-service, mm -hmm. in that for the most part, the industry has been so much get commit, get commit, get commit. And then I, I think we're starting to see more and more as things get beyond those that are dedicated to to get commit and get ops that there is a need for something that is a lot easier for those that may not be deep into get ops and get commits. I, I just want a thing. And then when you think about it from a pure value standpoint to the organization, while as a technologist, it's interesting when you start talking about GitOps and, and doing things with Git commits, but ultimately the value to the organization isn't that you were able to do it with the Git commit. It was that you were able to provide value to the business. Right. Well, that's right. But I mean, the thing we've talked about GitOps in, in the past, I mean, it's, 
it's you still have to execute stuff behind the scenes from a GitOps, per, just like this, right? This is only useful to the extent that you're going to define steps. And if the steps don't exist, you're going to have to know how to build the steps. Um, and the idea of building like, you know, is that actually, let me pause before I take it to the next, the next question. Does that, right? Am I, am I, am, this is building a mini workflow engine. They could cross uh, systems. So you could, assuming you have inputs and outputs, you could start actually chaining something together with these inputs. But that at some point that becomes really, really tricky, ugly. Yes, it gets quite tricky. And then even in terms of, even if we take specifically this example here of how it's being done, um, whether yeah. it be done via a direct API call, or maybe I might want to, to literally somehow have backstage create a, a Git commit that then triggers the actual operation. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. So, which is, isn't uncommon uh, because I think that's actually how the uh, ServiceNow and Terraform Enterprise plugin works or the integration works is that literally ServiceNow creates a Git commit um, in a Git repository. And then uh, Terraform Enterprise picks it up uh, via the webhook. Uh, I've done something similar from a, a design standpoint. Uh, and, and so when we start getting into UI driven uh, consumption, the lines really start to blur, in my opinion, of, of the the ideal practices that we might want to hold on to from a, sure. a back end technology standpoint. Well, the what you just described is is like I, I gave somebody a UI that builds a uh, does a commit to a Git repo that's actually then doing triggers like completely removed from that that perspective, which is good, I guess, because the Git repo then becomes my source of the trigger. But that's that's like very you know disconnected um, systems, right? They're they're loosely coupled. This is, I think the. Well, and depending upon your philosophy, one would argue it in a way it's the best of both worlds. Mm. Right. Cause you've, cause you're saying, because you've got a UX that's, that's pretty and somebody can do that work. If they're not, if they're not ready, they can, do, or if they're more advanced, they could just go to get, and you're going to get the right behavior either way. Yeah. In theory, you're modeling the, the exact same sort of behavior, except all I'm doing is just adding on a, a, a layer of UI, so to speak. Yeesh, we've talked about Git, Git hook polling versus web hook in, in the past. I think, I think you were on, I'm trying to remember if you were on that call or not. But, yeah, um, and so it becomes, becomes very interesting, even in a scenario like this, where you might say, you know what, do would I even want to consider the idea of doing it via Git commit? And then it becomes, in a sense, less deterministic, because then I then have to reach out and poll the the external system that's going to pick up that get some get commit to start performing validation of status. <laughs> and then feeding that back. And then this thing doesn't now, now this is, if you're going to get a list of that, you're going to have to do that through the, the other interface where you're getting the, the object in the object lists to see like the, the challenge is you can't see it. Uh, one of the things that um, and Xander, you might have an answer for this. I, how are the steps executed? Like it looks like, are they just done in the post when you say template create, it just spins up a thread and runs that template? It's, yeah, as far as I'm aware, I think it's just okay. as soon as you fill out this information, it, it does this and the UI will show you what step it's on and the output of each step. But, but if, I, if I created a whole bunch of asynchronous or long you know, steps that took time. That's a good question. I'd have to refer to the docs for that. Okay. I, I didn't see any threaded runner for this, I mean, I, a web a web service will will thread to to the extent that a page response is going. So I'm curious, um, curious if it's running in containers, given the the reference that Klaus made to the the steps similar to like uh, a CI system. It yeah. may very well be running each of the steps in containers, like uh, GitHub Actions or a Circle CI might run it. I didn't. I mean, this is a dev setup. I'm. You know, I, 
Xander, I'm assuming you did. I just did a dev setup. Yeah, this is actually the. Um, I haven't seen anything that has a uh, has runners or a runner pool in it. Um, okay, maybe I was yeah. being. A... I'm just skimming for any mention yeah. of how steps are run. Probably not in configuration. I, I yeah, I don't, I don't see anything. Seen, I haven't seen anything in the past talking about it. It's like a database and. Seems like a, uh, you know, the you would not want to build very big orchestrations with this. And there's not, I don't, I didn't see any logic either. So it's, it literally is a sequential steps. Sequential steps. Yep. Yeah, right here. This would be something that I, I, I assume their scaffolder is going to grow over time as they, they progress. I, I, I'm really intrigued by the idea of having the uh, decoupled event system, right? Where, where you do something here, but it's really triggering something that has an event that's going to cause something, right? That's, there's a chain, it's chain reaction. Yeah. You know. Cause then, uh, I was about to say potentially it gives you a, a an additional degree of reliability, but in theory it doesn't. Because I mean, in, the <laughs> thought could be, even with your your API call, you could add in logic to be a little more resilient in terms of the API call. Right. Well, hopefully, if it if the call fails, it would um, actually. Xander, can you can you build a, a step that fails or make the step you've got fail, just so we can see what what how it responds? Uh, yeah, I should be able to. Let's curious. Just um let's just throw perfect see if that still builds um this shouldn't matter <laughs> hope not yeah yeah we get a, a blank okay. message i didn't give it a, a message here but i think if i had passed something in here all right so yeah so if it um if your api fails at some step you're going to have to deal with whatever the cleanup is, but all going to come back. It's just like any, any other, Hey, look at that. Very nice. Yeah. I think for, for templates with more advanced, like greater amount of steps, then yeah, you could, it, it should definitely show you what step it's failing on this one. It's kind of a bad example because it's one single step. If I think if I checked this there, this is the provided template. I think that this one might have multiple steps. Yeah. Makes sense for the example too, yeah. Oh, this actually tries to go to GitHub, yeah. There you go, yeah. Uh, okay. So you can even click around between steps too and see individual outputs. That's nice, all right. This is the answering my question about what, what happened. You still might have a rollback problem from that perspective, but. And I think, I think we come back to the idea that I might have to, um, I might want to have a system that does the deeper orchestration behind it. Yeah, because in most cases you're just just making that single API call. Uh, but also in theory, in terms of the, the the rollback problem you were mentioning, is would be you could add in logic to obviously do a conditional, if there's a failure, then run this particular API call to delete the cluster or uh, whatever. Okay. So that way it's not, hey, it failed. Now you got to go clean up yourself. I, I hadn't seen that yet, but I haven't dug as deep yet. Xander, Xander's pulling it up. I I hadn't seen any rollback or cleanup logic in the in the spec. So it'd be a case um, if you hadn't built it yourself, very likely. Similar how the, mm. Xander added the the throw command, you would do the API call, oh, and then catch, as you're waiting for the API it. call, you would catch it inside your code. Oh, I oh. see. I thought you were saying from within the template no. to catch the error. Okay. Yeah, because I, I, I did. I did too, Xander. It's yeah. There's but not enough conditional logic in the steps, so you'd have to embed it inside your call in a single step. Which is now we're now we're getting into custom custom steps, oh God, yeah. specialized steps, right? Well, in theory, the the cleanup 
quote unquote, a rollback would probably be a function that you would be able to, to inject to various different steps that you might have of a multi-step process. Doesn't make it easier, but. <laughs> it's interesting. The other, the other thing to do would be to collect, to do steps that collected information. So you could, you, you'd still potentially want to, uh, you, you're still going to have a cleanup problem. So the, what, what I'm thinking is like, if you had, before you create a cluster in, in the example we have, you might come in and have guide somebody through two or three inquiry steps saying, Hey, there's, there's this, and then you need some information from that and then do the next step and then do the next step. It's interesting, but yeah, it's, it's simple. You know, I'm wondering if it would be possible to create an, an action called like fallback or something that lets you, you pass in an action that you want to try and then a fallback action to fall back to if that action fails. So that way you don't have to embed the catching within an action handler in case you're using a third party action that doesn't have that kind of fallback technique that you want to use. Hmm. That would be a schema extension from a backstage perspective, right? Mm -hmm. That would be, I wonder if the community is thinking about that. It seems, it's, I mean, it's, it seems like a, uh, not wouldn't be, would, would be a pretty, I would expect it to be a pretty common use case. Um, but I guess I'm thinking like I'm building something and it doesn't always, it doesn't always work. Well, it depends oh, on you're how, looking, you're, sorry, how you go would go. How, depends on how you would go about it. Because um, in theory, I might just create essentially a, a superset of the API, and oh. I handle the the logic on the system that's being called, as opposed to in backstage itself. Right. No, that's. I think. I think the question you're getting to is how much is, is in the, is in backstage, how much is in the back end? Yeah. It's the, the classic challenge that's of any time you're doing challenge. some orchestration. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. how, no, how much, how much logic around. do I try to do in the, the calling system versus the actual underlying system? Do you have a, do you have a rule of thumb? You've, you've been doing it for a while. So usually mine is going to be starting off with the, the best tool for the job. If I have to, to think really, really hard, about how I'm going to orchestrate or handle it in the calling system. If the calling system isn't equipped to do that, I'm just going to embed it or push it down further into a point where I feel comfortable. Uh, an example might be like a self-service platform calling Ansible. The self-service platform doesn't have great orchestration. I might move most of the logic down into the Ansible uh, script or the automation, handle it there, and then just keep it in there as opposed to try and handle it at the, the higher level. The other thing that starts to also do is starts to potentially allow me to decouple the two components. Because at some point I might say, you know what, I don't want this UI component or this UI way, or maybe I do want to do some additional testing of the orchestration outside of the UI. And it might be handed to a an individual that wants to test it on their local system or evaluate it. So those are usually the areas I start to get at is mm -hmm. um, best tool for the job. And then also start to consider, can I test it outside of the UI component? That makes a lot of sense. Or, or even exercise. Yeah. Test or exercise. Yeah. So that you're right. So that that comes back to this is almost entirely UX. There's no there's no non UX way that I'm seeing to drive to to test your scaffolding. That's that would be that would be an interesting. Right, you're you're we're literally going through, and every time we want to do a test, right, Xander, I'm assuming you're you're you have to poke it through the UX. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go back back to Martez's point. That's the, the way this is going to be structured is you're going to end up doing pretty much uh, its forms and hand off to a backend system. Okay. That's I mean that's there's plenty of backend systems. It's a reasonable right. There's no sense in turning this into an orchestrator. It's it's right designed as a 
you know, it's a, it's a catalog. Yeah. And it keeps that consistency when you talk about debugging issues of literally if the, the front end UI is literally just passing, making the API call, similar how I could do with the curl command or PowerShell or Python, then I can easily uh, debug and test of, hey, if it's not working in the UI, what's going on? Can I right. replicate this same issue at the, the command line and completely remove the UI component as a possible issue? That's an actually an interesting idea from a logging, like a, in the logs that are generating. Andrew, is it? Do you, do you know if if it's possible to dump things into the logs that it puts out? Uh, like here. You, yeah. Well, yeah, because you could. Well, so in, in when you built that template, it actually showed you output from each stage. Oh, you mean over in the the template and backstage, or sorry, the output and backstage. Yeah. So you you created you created the cluster. And it it gave you feedback at each step. You could actually tell you could actually so. tell people. Yeah, it looks it looks like we can do it through through here. Okay, so you could say, "Hey, I'm I'm going to tell you, yeah, creating cluster. You know, the, this is the JSON, or this is the right." This is nice. No, uh, it didn't Oops. like it. Uh, no, it, okay. No, it did it. It gave you the uh, error. The first one, I think the UUID change I had made, it's not fond of. I might have to. Oh, you need an await. That's the problem. It's not there yet. I think it, I might have to run this JSON first to actually decode the body. Oh, uh, okay. Let's see if that does anything. Boss, you've been quiet. What's what are you thinking? You're you're our, our fresh eyes. Oh, um, well, it's a little bit out of my comfort zone. So I, I've been okay. mostly uh, listening to what what Martis has been saying. Um, it, like my perspective on this is like looking at Bikesage as a potential internal dashboard. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, th th there are certain requirements that that I would have in my particular situation that are not necessarily universal, universally applicable. Um, things like uh, ensuring that uh, like certain or or certain resources are available to to some users and uh, and not to other ones. Yeah. Um, audit capabilities, etc. Um, so, I, I mean, at least for for my specific purposes, I think Backstage is probably um, too young of a project uh, to be useful. Sure. But uh, then again, like I, I I have a long shopping list, and and uh, comparing this to perhaps some of my, my some of my previous positions where where I was working with startups, it, it would certainly make more sense then uh, to, to be able to give developers uh, basically like a one or, or, or two click kind of self-service dashboard for creating um, like infrastructure for let's say test environments and, and so on. Um, I would have to play more with it though. So, mm -hmm. which is kind of why, why, why I've been mostly quiet to that. Like, I, I, I don't know enough about it yet to have a strong opinion. That makes sense. No, that's why I was just, um, we're, you know, this for us is a discovery, a discovery sprint. Um, did it let you recover? Xander, did you just recover that? I refreshed and I think the temporary log that had it had created through an error. So I had to refresh uh, okay. again to get rid of that. Cool. You're gonna bump into a naming collision. It did create it, didn't it? 
Yeah, it Let's did. See. Sorry, I, 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 this is my, this is my cluster in the background. So it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm watching, I, I have my own UX into it. <laughs> that should fix that problem. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> Joey's it's probably already failed. Joey's oh, wait, a there's, there's a start over button. Yeah. That's a, that, that's actually an, ex an example of building a step that says, uh, you know, uh, confirm. Hey, look at that. Looks like I got it to work here. It's the only problem is I have to pass this format JSON thing, which means I'll have to come in and update our code gen library to fix that and do that in here instead. Cool. As for us, that's one of the takeaways with this is that having a TypeScript library is super handy. <laughs> If you're well versed in TypeScript, if, if if you're that's this is where Xander's working at light speed compared to what I would have uh, been able to do from a, a demo perspective. That's really it's really cool though. But I, I I really like the idea that somebody can come back and just say, yeah, you know what, I'm I'm, you know, I don't want somebody to have to see all the operational details. Just give me, you know, I just need to create a cluster. Or I just need to, you know, do, take this operation. We had, we have, we have a couple of use cases that are like that. They're just more narrowly defined. It gets extra cool if somebody's already invested in backstage. That's and this to me is where it gets the, the thing gets sort of interesting. If somebody already has backstage, then you can give them a scaffold and then they can build this inside of their current system. It becomes that thing. You get the cataloging effect. Yeah. The challenge that I see at the moment, uh, to Klaus's point, uh, and, and I think it's going to continue to grow, but is, yeah. is that it is open source and uh, essentially unsupported, so to speak. And you start yeah. talking about enterprises wanting to, invest a lot of time and energy into it. I, I actually don't see that being uh, too much of a barrier. Um, I mean, particularly for inter internal use, open source software is not that, that much uh, looked down upon or, 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 or even like the lack of a strong uh, like support uh, contract like it, it again looking at it entirely for internal internal use um if you have a little bit of downtime on, on, on need to restore it without an sla um it might still be appealing to a lot of companies but uh particularly when you're dealing with a regulated industry uh then you there's certain features again like things like audit logs um, like having multi-tenant like access controls and so on that become nearly a must in, in most cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, I, my takeaway comes back to the same thing. It's, it, it's this is in in connecting into a system that does the access control and the audit logs and the orchestra right it's it's just a it's a it's a front end but but the barrier like if i'm if i'm building a project and i want to give somebody a front end you're you're you don't you're not you're not violating the back end hopefully you're not violating any of the back end contracts you're just making it easier to access them well, so if we take the uh, the create cluster as an example, so typically what's going to be done is Backstage is going to act as a broker and then utilize a service account to actually fulfill that request. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're going to have to ensure that the role-based access control is handled on the Backstage side because you're making an automatic assumption from, in this case, the rack inside that any request that comes through as the quote-unquote Backstage service account has been 
fully addressed from an auditing standpoint in backstage, as well as from an access standpoint to what somebody can or cannot provision. Yeah, but the user needs to needs to either identify to to the back end, uh, in which case again the, the front end needs to have the the capability of providing that information. Um or the user needs to authenticate with the front end on let's say via SAML or or, or some other information uh, or some other authentication method like that. Um, and then you the, the front end connects to the back end under that assumption and, and the front end is authorized to make a request on behalf of the user. It's like there's a, a permission model, so it might be well, this is Yeah, I mean, and, and Zan, this is one of the things that I know Xander ended up having to do some research on this. The, um, it's, it, it's a little tricky from that. Like it's, it's not, I, I agree with your, you on the cautions um, as far as, act, you know, who's, who's under whose authority are you making the request? Right now you're, you're, we're, we've got a, token api token that's that's interacting with digital rebar so you're right everything's coming through under backstage the backstage sites authority um and to make this really work right you'd, you'd want to have the the pass you'd want the user's authority to pass through or you'd want to have some some additional way to say for this user i've got these i've i've, I've got these secrets if I'm not mistaken, there's a, a user object here that we could somehow pass information into. I'm assuming with, hmm. you know, integrations or, or something of the sort. I don't know how to add custom integrations, though, is the only problem. But I think that would be the solution if we wanted to go from like a, a like a front end model to have the users authorize themselves and then send their information through our API. Yeah, I mean, you could do a, a pass through if there was likely to be a desire for that same user to log directly into Rackin. But if you never see a scenario where that user needs to log into Rackin and backstage will always be the front end, in theory, unless there's a heart requirement, you could continue to use the service account. <clears throat> Just make sure you're doing proper authentication and authorization and auditing in backstage for that given user. The, we have um, we have some of the ways that we we could handle things like that is that digital rebar can be distributed so you could actually create a endpoint that was uh you know when that right now the way Xander's doing it is bring your own endpoint so you provide the endpoint um and you might be providing just the ones you have permissions for so still have to figure out the token the token auth issue but but they'd have to provide their token with the uh, the endpoint when they add the endpoint. Or username and password. That's just not not either either one of them, right? At that point, you're credentialing the call in the in the in the template. But they, these are very you know these are these are tricky problems for any self service portal because you're effectively spanning your your front ending another system. Yeah. Well, Xander, I, I really appreciate you being uh, going on the spot for us. No, it's and, no problem. Uh, this is this is fascinating. Fun to watch you code a little bit too. Um, boy, and Martez, I, I I really appreciate your insights on this. Um, I think having you know actually coming back and saying, all right, yay, cool, I can create something with and the huge butt that comes after that of of how to think through the architecture is important too. So. This was really helpful and insightful. Thank you. Uh, really uh, helpful. Thank you, Sandra, for uh, showing us this. And um, also, uh, same thing. Uh, thank you, Martez, for uh, giving us uh, giving us your insights. Um, I, I'm also wondering, like, what other tool, like, what other tooling would fall under the same category, whether OSS or not? Um, mm -hmm. It kind of feels like similar to in some in some ways to things like Rundeck, Octopus Deploy. Um, 
I'm, tr- I'm just trying to. It's it's more of an aggregator than those. Um, so you literally be talking like somewhat in the space of a service now in terms of service catalog capabilities, but it looks to also provide things like technical documentation as like a wiki uh, really becomes that single pane of glass that most have shied away from. Uh, so CMPs or cloud management platforms sort of fall into an adjacent space, which is the company I work for is classified as a CMP. Um, I know manage IQ, uh, was one of the ones that Red Hat had bought. Uh, I know Ansible Automation Platform, formerly Ansible Tower, is doing is starting to hit more down the the self service catalog route. Um, and so there's a, a bit of I would say a focus towards some of that self service catalog, but also just broader information aggregator, in a sense. Yeah, I would I would put potentially like Cloudify or Spacelift in that. Okay, so Maybe. so th- there's a there's a bunch of names there that that, that I do recognize. So. Uh, I it but uh, I'm actually surprised that um, the answer one is moving in this direction. Uh, but I guess uh, I've been um, I've not been paying much attention to it lately. So I I have some catching up to do. Yeah, they're 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 trying to scale automation across the enterprise, and similar to to what we're seeing here uh, from this this example, for those that are not knee deep in a particular technology, having a easy button is super useful. Hmm. Wonderful, thanks. All right, everybody, appreciate the time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.